Now we continue our WNYC Centennial Series, 100 Years of 100 Things. This week we continue on the summary side with things number 11 and 12, 100 Years of the Jersey Shore and 100 Years of the Catskills. These go with our recent summer segments on 100 Years of Ice Cream and 100 Years of New York Baseball. In addition to, of course, we're doing more serious ones uh, that we've done in our first 10, 100 Years of Republican Presidential Candidates when that convention was going on, 100 Years of James Baldwin, born a century ago last week, and others. We have 90 to go, two per week for almost the next year on Mondays and Wednesdays. And here we are with thing number 11, 100 Years of the Jersey Shore, starting with Bruce Springsteen growing up from his very first album 51 years ago. He's been around for most of the last 100 years of the Jersey Shore in the public eye. Greetings from Asbury Park was that album. Here on a Monday when the weather should be great for the boardwalk, boardwalk and great for the beach. I said great for the beach, right? Not, a, not like a certain day in August 11 years ago when Governor Chris Christie, or wait, no, this was 13 years ago, do my math, when Governor Chris Christie had one of his most famous news conference moments. Again, at 8 o'clock tonight, the Garden State Parkway will close southbound from exit 98 south to be used exclusively then for emergency vehicles. And if tomorrow we need to set up contraflow on the Garden State Parkway, to continue the orderly evacuation of folks um, from the shore region um, uh, in those counties that I discussed earlier. So to folks again, uh, you know, I saw some of these news feeds that I've been watching upstairs of people sitting on the beach in Asbury Park. Get the hell off the beach in Asbury Park and get out. You're done. It's 430. You've maximized your tan. Get off the beach. No greetings to Asbury Park from Governor Chris Christie there. Remember that as Hurricane Irene was approaching on August 26, 2011. So 100 years of the Jersey Shore. We'll invite your oral history calls in just a minute. And we have two great guests, Deb Whitcraft, founder and president of the New Jersey Maritime Museum, and Emil Salvini, some of you know he hosted Tales of the Jersey Shore on NJTV and in a podcast version and is the author of several books on the history of the Jersey Shore, including Boardwalk Memories, Tales of the Jersey Shore. Deb and Emil, so great to have you. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to WNYC. Thank you. Well, thank you, pleasure. Brian, for having us. Emil, 100 years ago. Hi, Debbie. Hello, Emil. Glad you know each other. You can go to lunch <laughs> after the yeah. show. We go way back. So Emil, sorry. Emil, 100 years ago in 1924, Atlantic City was perhaps in its heyday, and you said it became popular in the 1800s because of railroads. So can you start us off by making that connection between railroads and the rise of Atlantic City or the Jersey Shore generally? Yes, yeah, sure, Brian. The... Uh uh, ra- the Atlantic City uh, was located uh, on a uh, at Seacon Island on the Jersey Shore, and at some point in the late 19th century, developers of uh, railroads decided if they almost drew a straight line from Philadelphia to the coast to at Seacon Island, uh, they would have a, a direct route. All the property owners would would prosper, and the railroads, and people would be able to go to the shore. Uh, for the first time in one day, you know, they could get the railroad in Philadelphia and uh, head out to Atlantic City. And uh, it became uh, America's playground almost overnight. So what might we have found in Atlantic City in 1924? And who might we have found there? You, you've called it a resort for working people. Yes, that's exactly right. And it, a lot of people thought that it was a uh, a resort for the wealthy, but it really was uh, a working people resort because uh, these are the people that would, uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard the term Shubies, but uh, they were people who yeah. would leave uh, for AC for the day. They packed their lunch in a shoebox, put it under the train seat, and uh, uh, the merchants didn't like it. But uh, the first time the day trippers could go back and forth, and it really was a, a working man's uh, resort. They didn't. The merchants didn't like people bringing their lunches in shoebox because they weren't buying 
the vendor's food. Exactly. And, uh, for, and as the pier started to appear, for uh, I think the steel pier, for $0.10, cents, you can spend the day there, and all of the attractions were free after these, you spent your dime. So you could pretty much go out to the, uh, the seashore uh, and spend very little. Deb, you've told us off the air that the very first seaside resort was already gone by the 1920s, a place called Tucker's Island. Where was that, and can you tell us anything about its heyday or about its demise? Well, Tucker's Island was actually, um, for, not formed, but um, inhabited beginning in the 1740s. It was the very first seashore resort of New Jersey, and Tucker's Island today actually exists underwater about um, a quarter mile off the southern end of Long Beach Island, which we call Holgate. Tucker's Island in the 1700s was on the bay side of Holgate and was inhabited by about uh, 65 to 70 people. It had two hotels, uh, the St. Albans and the Columbia, had a life-saving station, a church, a schoolhouse, and um, it was it was a very popular resort. And uh, at one time, it was attached to Long Beach Island, but then it became an island in itself. And um, as I said, it now, due to erosion and the migration of billions of cubic yards of sand, the south end of Long Beach Island has shifted closer to the mainland, and Tucker's Island, underwater, is in about nine or ten feet of water on the north side of Beach Haven Inlet. The well, lighthouse, by the way, fell into the sea in 1927. Huh. So if things that prominent, some early seaside resorts and the lighthouse have fallen into the sea, as you put it. Does that portend anything for the future? Does this relate to global warming? Uh, do we tie 1924 to 2024 in that way? Well, the Indians had it right. When the Indians used to come to these barrier islands, they came only to harvest the food, the sustenance that they needed, but they always retreated back to the mainland. We're not that smart apparently, because every new storm, whether it's the 44 hurricane, the 62 nor'easter, or superstorm Sandy, after these storms, we just build bigger and higher, and it, we just haven't, it hasn't uh, come to our minds that barrier islands were never meant to be developed. They are meant mm. to be a protective barrier between the sea and the mainland communities. So the Indians knew that. We're not that smart. So listeners, as we do 100 years of 100 things in this segment, we invite your oral history contributions. Who has a long enough family history with any place on the Jersey Shore to tell a story of how you or your parents or your grandparents have told you about seeing a change? Two one two four three three. WNYC, a rise and fall, or rise and rise story, or anything else, 212-433-WNYC. Anybody own a house on a barrier island that is no longer a house, but something for the fishes to swim around? 212-433-9692. Who has any kind of great Jersey Shore moment from your life that you'd like to share, a story of any kind, maybe that reflects something about the place or the culture of the place? that you think would be an interesting minute of history on the radio. If you have an early Springsteen story or do you love or hate the TV show Jersey Shore or for that matter, any other Jersey Shore pop culture or whatever, or maybe you were on the beach when Governor Christie told you to get the hell off before Hurricane Irene hit Asbury Park. It's your observations about Jersey Shore culture or how any shore community has changed or just a great story. 212 433 WNYC here on our WNYC Centennial Series, 100 Years of 100 Things. Thing number 11, 100 Years of the Jersey Shore, 212-433-WNYC. 
433-9692 with Deb Whitcraft, president of the New Jersey Maritime Museum, and Emil Salvini, who has hosted the TV show and podcast Tales of the Jersey Shore and has written shore history books, including Boardwalk Memories, Tales of the Jersey Shore. Emil, I see your Jersey Shore base is in Cape May, and you started down the path of being a Jersey Shore historian because your family had a cottage there. Do you want to tell us any of your own relationship to Cape May or how that got you curious about the history? Oh, yeah, uh, definitely, Brian. Uh, yeah, we we uh, purchased a cottage there for the family back in the 80s, uh, and it uh, was built in 1905. And uh, it got my interest up. Uh, my wife used to tease me, whatever town we lived in, I ended up researching and writing a history about it. So I started looking into Cape May, which a lot of people don't realize the town is a, is a historic landmark, a national historic landmark with over 600 Victorian structures. So I just got hooked. And, uh, and I, uh, one of my additional books is called The Summer City by the Sea, and that is about Cape May. But, uh, you know, as I researched the house and who owned it before us and things like that, I started doing the entire uh, history of Cape May, and then I moved up the shore. So uh, uh, usually people in New York, uh, North Jersey and New York, we say we're going down the shore. Right. But uh, I kind of went up the shore. So And, and Deb, how do you Cape get May so... Cape very interesting. Go, go ahead. Sorry. You can finish your thought, Emil. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I was just saying that it's, a, it's an amazing place. It's the first boardwalk on the Jersey coast, although Atlantic City was a few years later. And uh, it had the first large crowds because people uh, accessed it through the sea one before there were railroads. So uh, it, uh, it, it was uh, the first resort uh, along the uh, Jersey coast. Where did the boardwalk come from? How old is that idea? Oh, well, that, that goes back to uh, the uh, Atlantic City and Cape May uh, as the railroads got became popular and the Pullman cars were, were plush and the hotels were getting uh, nicer. They, uh, their big problem was sand. Uh, people were, uh, you know, sand was sticking to their shoes. Anybody who's experienced that knows what that's like. So they came up with the concept of a board walk. It literally was laying boards along the shoreline and in the winter moving those boards it was portable up to higher ground and uh little by little they kept building them and uh atlantic city right now it's the fifth and final boardwalk that's there uh and it's uh, five miles long uh the shortest uh boardwalk in new jersey is uh 200 feet and mm. uh, i like to say if you line them up end to end they're uh, 32 miles of boardwalk there you go. And so, Deb, uh, and again, I'll remind people, Deb Woodcraft is founder and president of the New Jersey Maritime Museum. Where is the museum and what would people see there? The New Jersey Maritime Museum is in Beach Haven on Long Beach Island, about um, almost seven miles south on Long Beach Island when you come over the bridge and make a right-hand turn. And by the way, when Emil was talking about boardwalks, we used to have a boardwalk in Beach Haven, but uh, it was washed away during the 1944 hurricane, and it was never rebuilt. Here's a tidbit we got from you, Deb. The phrase, the real McCoy, to describe oh, something authentic and of quality, originated around the Jersey Shore in the Prohibition era. I didn't know that until you told my producer and she told me. Want to tell that story? Oh, yeah. Bill McCoy was a, a very charismatic, good-looking man who, uh, during the years of Prohibition, he was a Jersey rum runner. And uh, unfortunately, back in the, in the early 30s, rum runners often diluted their booze with all kinds of poisonous uh, liquids, uh, including formaldehyde. Well, William McCoy would uh, sell his alcohol undiluted of course they diluted it to increase their profits but they coined the term the real mccoy so that if you bought your alcohol from bill mccoy you didn't have to worry about bathtub gin 
or being poisoned by it because he never diluted it. So they coined the term the real McCoy. You were laughing there, Emil. You want to add something about the real McCoy or prohibition? No, just just that uh, uh, Deborah always has these wonderful stories about the about the uh, coastline and and these old sayings that, I, that you know sometimes that all the research I've done I I haven't heard. I'm uh, uh, glad she shared it with everybody in your audience. Jerry, uh, now of Manhattan, you're on WNYC. Hi, Jerry. Hi, Brian. I'm a longtime fan, first time caller. I'm probably a little nervous, but. I had an Italian family in New Jersey. Uh, We lived in Cliffside Park, and my dad would take the family every year from the time I was five years old to Belmar or to Asbury Park, and we would rent a little bungalow cottage down there for uh, either a week or two weeks. And we'd go to Asbury Park for all the rides. We would go to the beach on Belmar, which has a very deep, white, sandy beach that's really beautiful compared to black places in Florida. And we would spend the, you know, the week or two there just enjoying it, going to the beach every day, great restaurants, those famous New Jersey diners. And I have so many fond memories of that. My dad died when I was 19. Mm. And when I got out of college, I went with three of my buddies and we rented a, a bungalow right in Belmar. And at that time, we drove to the Stone Pony because we heard Pete Fornital had this new artist he liked called Bruce Springsteen. We went into the Stone Pony. Pete Fornital was a, was a DJ e for people band. who don't know. Go ahead. Yep. Yeah, we heard the E Street Band and Bruce. We sit, We stayed for two sets and couldn't believe their energy and their high vibes. And we wound up buying beers for Bruce and the guys. So he wasn't a teetotaler then. And they reciprocated by buying us beers. And we sat there during their breaks saying, you guys are going to be big stars. Just keep it up. You are great. Oh, thank you, man. Thank you, Bruce would say. He was like very shy when he wasn't singing. But just brilliant memories I have of the Jersey Shore, Asbury. Uh, I told your producer that between Asbury and uh, Belmar is in a little town. And, and I'm sorry, I can't remember it. I think I'm nervous. But they had a hotel where you could get a meal in the late 70s for like a dollar fifty, And it could be <laughs> like steak and mashed potatoes, you know, vegetables, cake and coffee, all for a dollar fifty. Uh, God, I, I wish I could remember the name. The dollar fifty steak. Jerry, thank you very much. You did great. And how about that? A Bruce Springsteen before he was famous story. And let's go next to Ken great. and Stamford, you're on WNYC. Hi, Ken. Hi, how are you? My mom was born in Atlantic City in 1917. She had an older brother. Her parents had a very successful large auction gallery called the Boardwalk Auction Gallery. Very different. We went to Atlantic City, our family, for many, many 50s, 60s. You know, in the 50s and 60s, there was a lot of honky-tonk junk, but this was a very very elegant auction gallery. People came from all over the East Coast, high-end furniture, antique furniture, jewelry, things like that. As it turns out, I guess that was in the 20s, and to be successful then, you had to have some contact with the man who was in Boardwalk Empire, Enoch Johnson. Apparently, I found out <laughs> much later that they were, they were friends, the family, her parents or her father especially, we're friends with him. Now, Boardwalk Empire, although a wonderful, wonderful show and the depiction of Atlantic City, apparently Johnson was nowhere near as violent as, as, as the film makes out. But apparently, uh, my, my grandparents traveled in the summers, but they rented, they had a large house on Plaza Place near the bay, and they rented it to, to, to Nookie Johnson in the, in the summers, interestingly enough. My mom was very, very beautiful and she became, I think, as a teen, there was a contest, Miss, Miss Atlantic City or something oh. like that. The Steel Pier had this contest. Uh, in addition, I'm trying to think what else. Oh, her her brother got into journalism and had a newspaper for a while called the Atlantic City Press. Another anecdote, which isn't connected to family, in 1980 or so, I met a man named Mr. Toll in Palm Beach. He and his partner, who had uh, run the Holiday Inn, 
as Atlantic City declined in the 50s and 60s, they bought up all the property on the boardwalk, and they were regarded, I think they were lawyers, they were regarded as morons. People said, what's going on? You know, they're, they're decrepit uh, boarding houses, whatever. Well, they ended up in the 80s when I met this gentleman. He was in his 80s. He owned, he and his partner did not sell the land to the casinos. He owned all the land and rented it to the casinos. And that time, I think he was making hundreds of thousands of dollars a day. And I think they became the Toll Brothers family or the Toll oh. Gallery, I think, was their daughter. Huh. At any rate, just an interesting Toll Brothers anecdote. developers. They're great stories, Ken. Thank you very much. Uh, by the way, before it gets too far away from the previous caller, a listener texts that they think they know the name of the restaurant that the caller Jerry mentioned where they sold the dollar fifty steaks and he couldn't remember it. The caller thinks or the texter thinks the caller was talking about the sampler inn in Ocean Grove and writes that it burned down in the nineties. Emil, anything from, from that last caller? Spark anything for you as a Jersey Shore historian? Maybe the uh, historical accuracy of anything in Boardwalk Empire or anything else Ken said? Well, well, sure. Uh, uh, Enoch was uh, was uh, part of the political uh, empire with uh, Jersey City's Frank I and the Law Hague. <laughs> mm. <laughs> they were uh, they they really uh, uh, ruled the Atlantic City for a time, and naturally Frank Jersey City. But uh, I did think of a great Belmar story of interest at the boardwalk. That fellow mentioned Belmar. Uh, I had done a show on the Belmar boardwalk, and the mayor was wonderful that he introduced me to the engineer for the boardwalk. And they had just finished completing it in Trex, which is uh, impregnated uh, plastic wood, so it'll last 100 years. And the next year, I got a call from him, and he said, you remember that beautiful boardwalk that you filmed on? And I said, yes. He said, it's gone. That was right after Sandy. He said, the whole thing just washed into the ocean. And uh, I, I always, when I think of Belmar, I, I think of that story. He was, he was brokenhearted. And, Deb, you were talking about Prohibition before and the rum runners. And I think Mark in Long Island City has a family story from that era. Mark, you're on WNYC. Thank you for calling in. Hi, Brian. Good morning. How are you? Okay. Yeah, so just a quick funny story. Uh, my great-grandfather, he emigrated from what was then the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and he was trained as a leather tanner. So he ended up uh, as a bootlegger for the Jewish mafia because he was allowed to still uh, manufacture alcohol. Uh, so we had a house on the Jersey Shore in West End, and there were uh, wild grapes growing in the backyard from when he had made the alcohol. That's a story. Deb, a person who at least heard about his great-grandfather uh, being involved in that, and then the, the grapes for the illegal alcohol were still growing on the property. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great story. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, Deb, I see that one of the things that people can learn at muse your museum is about shipwrecks off the Jersey Shore. You say there have been more than off any other coastal state. Really? And if so, why? Brian, the, the coast of New Jersey, as you know, extends 127 miles between uh, Sandy Hook and Cape May. And the New Jersey has more shipwrecks off its coast than any other state in the entire country, including the Carolinas. And uh, it truly is the graveyard of the Atlantic. And of course, uh, there's a number of factors uh, that contribute to this number. But for over 200 years, the ports of New York and Philadelphia were two of the world's major centers of shipborne commerce. And, you know, back 100 years, 200 years ago, they didn't have the navigational aids that we have today and just the bow-like configuration of the coast and the constant change in, in shoaling um, precipitated so many of these disasters. But we have over 7,200 shipwrecks off the New Jersey coast. And, and um Thank God, because the divers bring us thousands of artifacts mm. from these shipwrecks that they donate so that members of the non-diving community 
can see what's off the Jersey coast. And in fact, and a, a listener, people... a listener texts, my grandmother was working on the Asbury park boardwalk at an ice cream parlor in 1934 when the SS Morrow uh, castle washed uh-huh. up on the shore. And by the way, several more people texting to say that the restaurant that the earlier caller was trying to remember probably is the Sampler Inn in Ocean Grove. So a number of shout outs to that. All right. We are in our WNYC Centennial Series, 100 Years of 100 Things. Thing number 11 today, 100 Years of the Jersey Shore. On Wednesday, it'll be 100 Years of the Catskills as we continue on summer destinations in the series before getting back to political history segments next week when the Democratic Convention is taking place. We'll keep taking your calls in this segment with your Jersey Shore family stories or observations about change at any Jersey Shore location that you've seen or experienced over time or anything related. 212-433-WNYC. Call or text with our guests Deb Whitcraft, president of the New Jersey Maritime Museum, and Emil Salvini, who has hosted the TV show and podcast, Tales of the Jersey Shore, and has written Jersey Shore history books, including Boardwalk Memories, Tales of the Jersey Shore. We continue. As we continue in our WNYC Centennial Series, 100 Years of 100 Things, thing number 11, 100 Years of the Jersey Shore, with historians Deb Whitcraft and Emil Salvini and your oral history calls at 212-433-9692 and Catherine and Brick. You're on WNYC. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Brian. Thank you so much for taking my call. I apologize. You might hear my newborn daughter in the background making her radio debut. Yes. But yes, I'm a, I'm a Bergen County native. I grew up going to Beach Haven. My family is from North Jersey and has a lot of history down the shore. But one of the reasons we wound up in Brick, or my parents did rather, is that when compared to a lot of the barrier islands and other shore towns, it's pretty climate resilient. Um, the flooding is not as bad here in extreme storms. That's, you know, depends on where you are. But it is overall a little bit more climate resilient. And there's a lot of cool things coming here as well. Shout out to Icarus Brewing Company. Um, but one thing I see all around here is a heavy resistance to offshore wind and renewable energy, uh, which would, of course, help the shore survive. So as a millennial with a newborn daughter, I want to shout out, yes, it's great to hear about the history of the shore, but I don't want the shore to become history itself. Um, we need these renewable energy projects. And thank you so much. Catherine, thank you so much. And, you know, Deb and Emil, I'll get you on this, too. Deb, tease me up. For, I mean, Catherine teased me up for um, exactly how I like to end a lot of these segments, which is, what do you think things are going to be like 100 years from now? Deb, for you, who's traced 100 years of maritime uh, at the Jersey Shore in the Maritime Museum, including so many things that have been washed away, and you hear the caller, Catherine, concerned about the future. Well, and she brings up some good points. Of course, it's a it's a highly politicized uh, topic, and uh, I, as a nonprofit organization, I try to stay out of it, but I actually agree with her. And I think the future of Long Beach Island, especially the South End, Beach Haven and Holgate, where I live, I think 100 years from now, it's not going to be here. The erosion and the shifting of all of these sands is speeding up. Uh, and um, I, I actually think that, that much of Long Beach Island 100 years from now will not be here at all. It'll be like Tucker's Island. Emil? Well, I could give you a quick example, Brian. Uh, right south of Cape May, there's, as I call it, a ghost town, but there was a town there of uh, South Cape May, and that is all gone. It's underwater due to erosion. And uh, every once in a while, you'll see a railroad track or a foundation uh, appear, depending on if there was a storm or not. And I unfortunately see a lot of the the Jersey Shore ending up as uh, South Cape May. Uh, It's uh, long gone since the 1940s. Huh. And, you know, the caller talked about the uh, some of the nice things coming to where she is. Uh, but Deb, I think you mentioned something to us off the air uh, about your concern that the Jersey Shore, which 
we've talked about in the context of being a summer destination for working families is becoming like the Hampton South. How much are you seeing that? <laughs> it's an understatement. It is truly the Hampton South. I've lived here all my life. I'm 69 years old. And the average middle class working family cannot afford to come to Long Beach Island and pay such exorbitant, outrageous rents. For what they get personally, if I didn't live here, I would never spend the kind of money some of these people are spending to have a week here on Long Beach Island. And I'm sorry to have to say that, but we've become a rich person's uh, island. And um, I've seen it for 69 years. And uh, although I love it here and will never leave except in a body bay, I, I can mm. see that we are the ham south. Emil, maybe different uh, neighborhoods or different areas of the shore for different incomes? Or you think it's all becoming Hampton yes, South? That, yeah, it, it really is. Uh, I mean, uh, giving Cape May as an example, uh, the homes there are, are ridiculously priced at this point, the, the old Victorians. And I, they not only need a lot of work, Brian, but there's a, a historical commission down there which ensures that they keep their landmark status so you cannot do anything to the outside of your home without going before the commission. Uh, inside, they don't have anything to do with, and they don't care what color you paint it, but you can't put up a fence or anything without going there. So it gets very expensive to live there on top of the, the entry price to, to even buy a home. And for the vacationers who aren't trying to buy? Uh, very, very expensive. Uh, we, we never rented our cottage, but I'm constantly being... Uh, uh, but put in touch with realtors that are saying, you know, do you realize how much you get a week for this? And uh, mm. yeah, I think it's getting very pricey for people that just want to stay down there because it's dis of its distance. Brian, people stay down there for uh, a week or two weeks. It's it's not something you usually go down for the weekend. It's in contrast, I think, to a memory we're going to hear from Patty now of another short town, Merrick. On Long Island. You're on WNYC, Patty. Hi. Hi. Um, I am from Merrick, but I grew up in New Jersey. And I thank you for focusing on the Jersey Shore as one of your topics. Um, I am 81 years old. And from the time I was born, my family owned a bungalow in Manasquan. In fact, it was on one street and then it was moved down several blocks to the same street so it was just sitting up on blocks I'm a family of six children and both parents and we had the most wonderful wonderful memories of our time in Manasquan it was a very um, or mostly or a lot of working class people there were some larger homes but ours was definitely a bungalow we could fit as many as 30 some people overnight when the whole crowd came um, we had um, large weeds in our backyard, and we would play hide-and-seek for hours. It was just magnificent. So I'm, I'm sorry to hear that um, things are so expensive there, but I do know that this bungalow still exists because a few years ago I went and checked it out, and I mentioned to the um, present owners how many people we would have there and they said, yeah, the same thing is still going on here. So I wish everybody had such a magical place to spend time with in the summer. Thank wonderful. You. Thank you. Wonderful memories. Wonderful story. Let me go right to Kim in Middletown, Jersey. You're on WNYC. Hi, Kim. Hi, Brian. I'm so excited. Uh, my husband and I are just the biggest fans. Um, I just wanted to say um, you really can't talk about the Jersey Shore without mentioning Brian Kirk and the Jerks. Um, they're a band that's been entertaining crowds for at least 30 years in Seabright and beyond. And he's an old friend of mine from high school. And I'm just so happy. He's he's just he's a local celeb. Can't, can't <laughs> and thank he, you. I'm sure people have lots of memories of his uh, performances. A Emil, uh, uh, a Jersey Shore band not called Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band. Uh, not one in in, in uh, particular, but. Uh, there, there is a, uh, a, a a bar called the Rusty Nail, which I love in, uh, in Cape May, and, and they've got great local music and musicians uh, every weekend. But I can't name really one in, in particular. Yeah. 
you you got any pop culture, Deb? Um, that's you know not Bruce, and uh, I guess after that last <laughs> call, or not Brian Kirk and the Jerks, or not well, music for that matter. <laughs> on Long Beach Island, we used to have the Joe Pop Shore Bar, and we had some some quite um, uh, well known uh, entertainers like Tiny Tim, and huh. um, it was a it was a big deal. We had the Wharf Rats at Bay Village and Schooner's Wharf. And um, sadly, Schooner's Wharf that attracts so many tourists and, and visitors, it's on the market now for, I think, $7.2 wow. $7. million. Wow. So it'll probably end up go. to be another condominium project. But at one time, we had some very, uh, some, some excellent entertainers who became quite famous. And there we leave it. A hundred years of a hundred things. Thing number eleven. A hundred years of the Jersey Shore with Deb Whitcraft, Whitcraft, founder and president of the New Jersey Maritime Museum, and Emil Salvini, who hosted Tales of the Jersey Shore on NJTV and in the podcast version, and is author of several books on the history of the Jersey Shore, including Boardwalk Memories, Tales of the Jersey Shore. This was so much fun for me, for our callers. I hope you too enjoyed it. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Wednesday Thing 12, 100 Years of the Catskills. Brian Lehrer on WNYC. Stay tuned for Allison.